Welcome everyone to our student services webinar on getting started with meal prep, secrets to support student success from iSchool Student Services. And today's agenda, we'll start by talking a little bit about why this topic and then we'll get into tips from three of your favorite faculty. Today we have Dr. Sue Allman, Dr. Joni Bodar, and Dr. Michelle A.L. Viagran joining us for this topic, followed by some discussion with everyone from our community. So thanks a lot for being here today. To start out on why this topic, I wanted to give you this a little story and we'll, in our storytelling, we'll go back to when I had a toddler and a uh, preschooler, a toddler and a five-year-old, and I was getting ready to go back to work, and I would drop off the kids at preschool, and I would be so flustered, and I would get to the preschool class, and the preschool teacher, she was always so elegant and put together and cheerful and happy, and I knew that she had two kids. And one day I finally just walked up to her and I said, what's the deal? What's the secret here? Can you help me out? And she said, I do my meal prep on the weekend and this is how I do it. And I put it in the freezer and then every day I have my materials ready to go for that night's dinner. And I said, oh, what a revelation. If only I knew this before. And so I've been do doing meal prep for a very long time. And I wanted to share um, some of my tips with students. Um, student life is so busy. What are some of the pros in meal prep in advance? Well, it's cheaper than running out for takeout, um, for restaurant food on the fly. It can help you build in more time in your work week for a workout, homework, caregiving, and self-care. And you can better control your costs, your portion sizes, and sodium content, et cetera, if you have those questions. For cons, because there are a few, it does take a significant portion of the weekend to do your meal prep ahead for a family. It could be monotonous to eat the same things uh, during the week, and it can take some investment in your time in finding the right recipes that you will enjoy. So um, I would just thought I'd give you my top five tools for meal prep. I use a pressure cooker for my dry beans and my rice. I use a slow cooker for big batches of stews, soups, curries, and all kinds of things that could be frozen. And I have a dedicated seed grinder, aka coffee bean grinder, which I use just for my seeds, like flax seeds. This way I could grind them that morning and add them to my breakfast, which I have prepped ahead of time. Um, glass containers. Um, if, you'll, if you'll see in the photo to the right, um, that's a photo of some of my lunch prep. But uh, I recently learned, like in the last week, that these black plastic um, meal prep containers contain fire retardants. So that's a big no-no. I need to transition my food meal preps into glass containers. So that's something I'll be working on. And then finally, a garage fridge. If you live in a house, you have a space. Um, I got myself a second fridge. It's an apartment size fridge and it um, is a perfect size for stacks of these meal prepped um, containers. So I can just go shopping out there <laughs> and the kids can just grab their prepped lunch and put it in their own lunch box the morning of. As far as favorite meal inspirations, I love uh, the plant-based school. This is a husband and wife team. They have social media and their own website, so you can check that out. Now we're going to turn over the floor to Dr. Sue Ullman. Thank you, Sheila, for organizing this. I think that's really helpful um, and uh, great tips from you and from the others on the panel. So what I want to do today is um, give you some ideas for delicious, nutritious, quick and easy meals that won't break the bank. I'm all about um, economy. So um, I've got lots of websites uh, that are on the slides that you may not have time to copy down or click into, but I believe that they will be available at the end of this presentation so that you'll be able to go into them. Next slide. 
So um, this is a summary of what I'm going to be saying in the next few slides. Um, and I remember when I was in grad school, uh, there weren't as many opportunities or options that there are now. <clears throat> but I do remember um, eating on a budget and, and having time to prepare things while I was still in the, the throes of graduate work. So research the stores that are near you to know what is available um, and see if you can find some that are more economically minded than other of the big chains. Make sure that you know what is in your cupboard and your refrigerator and your freezer before you shop uh, so that you don't over buy things that you already have. Always go to the store with a list so that you'll avoid impulse buying. I start with a list, but then because I know what is in my cupboard, my pantry, my freezer, and I see things that are on special, I will veer off that list. It's not really impulse buying, but it's looking to the future um, to see what uh, will fill the need that I have. And as Sheila said, a slow cooker, a crock pot. Um, and there are some or many, many places online where you can get really good recipes. Uh, the Food Network has some that are um, easy to prepare so that you can um, cook on the day of or cook ahead. It depends how many people are in your family uh, that you're cooking for. So before I had a full family, now uh, it's uh, my husband, myself, and the dog. Uh, so... We'll move on for that. Next slide, please. Um, in a, uh, again, a summary, kitchen wizardry. I'm going to touch on bulk buying. I know that um, Dr. Bodart is going to uh, focus on that exclusively. Shopping at a discount or clearance, uh, planning the meals based on sales, um, cooking with cheaper protein options, shop seasonally, Using leftovers wisely. This is a big one for me that I'll talk about. Making a weekly meal plan and do-it-yourself snacks and breakfast. Next slide. <clears throat> Buying in bulk. Um, Costco and Sam's Club are great places that are nationally known uh, that you can buy things in bulk. You do need to pay the upfront uh, fee for the year, and I know Costco has just raised its um, annual fee. But if you have the room and have the people uh, to be able to that need uh, lots of food, then this is one strategy to use. I was just talking to my daughter before this session, and she said Costco is getting so crowded on the weekends that she's trying to find time during the week to go there. <clears throat> but those are. Um, Two places that you can go for sales or discounts. So, and don't forget to store them properly so that you um, may buy a lot. But if it perishes or goes bad, um, then you've just wasted uh, money and time. Next slide. <clears throat> Shopping at discount or clearance sections. Just about all grocery stores have an aisle or a portion of an aisle where they have food that is nearing expiration um, or that they've just overstocked. So know where they are in uh, the stores where you shop and they're still good to consume. Uh, check for the dates, see if it's something that you will use, that you will eat, that you have a place to store it and then buy it. Uh, so either to cook it up right away or to freeze it. I live near an Aldi. Aldi and I are, you know, attached at the uh, hip. So uh, I don't know if you know Aldi. Uh, it is a national chain. It's uh, more prevalent, I think, in the east and uh, the mid part of the country, but is slowly moving west. I know there are some stores there. It's a German-based company. It's no frills. You take your own bags. Uh, there's no gorgeous displays like in some of the big uh, grocery store chains, but it goes quickly so that I found the produce to be very fresh and um, certainly dollars more, less expensive than in uh, a comparable high-end grocery store. Uh, and then Grocery Outlet, which I don't have one near me, but that is also national. Uh, so I would uh, check what they have and then stock up. 
um, at Aldi. They do have things that are there all the time. But uh, since I've been going there for the last X number of years, uh, they have now added in a meat department, which was never, never there before. And their salmon is at a very reduced price and we believe is better than um, in a fish market. Uh, that we get locally. We're, we're certainly inland, uh, so it's it's not like being at the shore. But, um, you know, and I'm not getting paid to say it, but Aldi is my store. Um, next slide. And as I said before, plan meals that are based on sales if you have the time. Uh, you can look for coupons, look at the flyers that come out from the stores every week. I don't have time for that, um, but I do know that uh, they are very useful for those people who do have the time. And look at the apps uh, for where you can get discounts at the stores where you shop. Uh, Flip is uh, has weekly ads and discounts, and that's um, flip.com. And Ibotta, where you can get cash back on grocery purchases. So, you know, if you are um, able to Add those apps. You can compare prices, track deals, and then you can plan meals around the discounted items. Sometimes you'll find things that are just unbelievably inexpensive. And then other uh, times, you, you know, I will just catch my breath that it can't possibly be that expensive. So um, be aware of what is out there, what you need, and what you can afford. Next slide. Um, and as Sheila said, prepare freezer-friendly meals. Um, make meals in bulk and freeze them in portions. If you've got the time, it doesn't have to be a weekend, but days that you have off. Um, I like to prepare things the day of um, and then use my leftovers wisely. The reason I do this is because I like to um, buy once a week if possible I um, have in my mind what I'm going to have on which day, what will go with it, and then uh, how much I think will be left over to be able to reuse. My go-to website is allrecipes.com. For me, it's far and above everything else because it's uh, quick, easy recipes, um, economic. You don't have to go through a whole list of ingredients. The other thing about all recipes, and it's not the only site that does it, but I will key in what I have in my refrigerator that needs to be used up quickly, and voila, the recipes appear that are not boring, that are delicious. You can make them spicy. Uh, you can tailor them to your taste. Uh, so one of my top recommendations, along with Aldi, is allrecipes.com. There's also uh, onceamonthmeals.com where you can get ideas for freezer meals. So look at some of these uh, things, see what you would like, see how much prep time it will take, um, and you know plan for that. One thing, which you probably would already know, but I will say it, to put dates on when you freeze things so that uh, you don't leave it in the freezer for too long. And again, always go to the store with a list. Next slide. Um, cooking with cheaper protein options, uh, whether uh, you are vegetarian or vegan, or if you do eat meat, um, there are lots of strategies to get budget-friendly protein items. Um, you can use cheaper cuts of meat, uh, and you can use beans, lentils, um, pastas. Um, Eat Well, Spend Smart is another website to get simple, low-cost meal ideas. And I browse these every so often just to get ideas of what I might like. And then I can put it on my list if I don't have those uh, spices or items in, uh, in my pantry. And then if for plant-based, affordable recipes, minimalistbaker.com. Uh, that you can, there again, uh, get things that are affordable and easy to access.
And then uh, stretch meats and other uh, items by adding them to stir fry soups or casseroles. And they can be for a couple days or you, if you've got leftovers, freeze them. Um, there we go. Shop seasonally and locally. Uh, I do believe in supporting uh, the local farmers and uh, stores. Know, though, what the prices are. Sometimes I find that at farmer's markets, uh, the prices are steeper than um, in a grocery store where they buy in bulk and that they can uh, lower the cost. So you have to weigh that, whether you're going to support the locals um, and pay a little bit more in some instances. Sometimes you can get things less expensively. You just have to be savvy about what prices are and uh, what you need. In my freezer, I have so much corn that has been cut off the cob this summer and um, tomatoes, uh, raspberries, things that were uh, very plentiful that now I can use throughout the winter. Um, localharvest.org will help you find farmers markets that are near you. I live in the east and our farmers markets are over for the season. But for those of you lucky enough to live in uh, climates that have year-round produce, uh, then you can use this site. Um, also, seasonal food guide to know what's in season. So I would say, you know, bookmark some of these sites that I'm listing if they appeal to you, and then you can browse through them uh, when you have some extra time. Next slide. Again, using leftovers wisely. I plan for meals uh, that I know can go beyond the one day. So last night, um, it was Halloween, trick-or-treating, right at dinner hour. So I put things in the crock pot more than we would eat. Um, and now I have them to make uh, as a stir fry. I'm adding some rice and this will keep me for another day or two. Um, repurpose them to avoid waste. Uh, so some examples, you know, you can take chicken into chicken soup or tacos. Um, and this website, Love Food, Hate Waste, is tips for reducing food waste. And then leftover recipes, um, creative ways to use leftovers. Um, some ideas that people have that I haven't thought of, and they can be really helpful. Next slide. Um, as Sheila said at the beginning, make a weekly meal plan. Um, and... So you'll just buy what you need uh, so that you don't go overboard if it's something that's going to perish. But you can do personalized meal plans. Um, you can do them online. You can write them out. Uh, Mealime.com and Yumly.com uh, can give you charts to uh, put in what appeals to you. And then it gives you meal ideas and recipes. So once again, build your plan around sale items and what you already have. There again, I go back to allrecipes.com, typing in what I have and voila, out comes a gourmet list that um, is not expensive and is easy to do. Next slide. And do-it-yourself snacks and breakfast. There's all kinds of things. Um, I would never put up a picture like Sheila had of those magnificent dishes that you prepared. Those were um, for Better Homes and Gardens and uh, Gourmet Magazine. Uh, mine aren't that fancy. Uh, what I do, though, is um, oatmeal sticks with you. And I get the uh, steel-cut um, oatmeal and make a batch of it uh, for myself. And it lasts five days um, and then I take whatever fruits that I have found that are on sale um, or I can afford. And I always have bananas add into uh, the oatmeal in the morning, uh, blackberries, blueberries, um, raisins. Uh, so uh, you do can, can make uh, smoothies and muffins and parfaits. Um, I'm an oatmeal kind of person. And then CheapEats.com has budget-friendly snack ideas and the kitchen for homemade snacks. So use the simple ingredients that um, oats, fruits, nuts, and some of the grains that Sheila was top, talking about at the beginning. I don't think I have any more slides, but I might have one more.
Oh, yes, this is my find from my daughter. It's a late-breaking recommendation, Chipotle Catering. She said that her husband was in grad school with this man who didn't work, and he said repeatedly, I don't know how that man lives without working. And he asked him, and he said, well, it's Chipotle Catering. Well, I didn't believe it for a minute, and I went online, and last week when I looked at this, you can build your own options with three proteins, all the bases, four salsas for $13.50. For a single, that could last you days. Um, it could, it, you would just have to try it once to see how long it will go. So um, I haven't tried it myself, but looking at all the things that they have online that you can buy it for one person, for two, for three, for four, um, and do your own individualized catering um, that will save you time, um, maybe some money, and uh, you've got um, a healthy, nutritious meal in front of you. Now, I do think that is my last slide. So thank you so much. Oh, that was incredible. Thank you so much for all those wonderful tips. On to you, Dr. Bodar. Okay, I'm going to talk about bulk buying and storage tips. And while um, Sue said she used some of her ideas when she was in grad school, um, when I was in grad school, I, I didn't have any money. And so I lived on giant bottles of tonic water, which I loved, and um, uh, Kraft mac and cheese. And that's why I don't eat mac and cheese anymore, ever. I don't care how good it is, how gourmet it is. I'm not going to eat it. Next. Okay, this is what I do um, around grocery shopping. Next. There are ways to buy things that I think will be really helpful to you. Um, you can buy large amounts <clears throat> of bulk things and then break them up into um, uh, other containers. One of the things that I do, I, I like the way different pastas look. And so I have um, all different kinds of, of containers that used to have food in them or that I found at garage sales or that I found cheap someplace. And I have all of my uh, pastas in these containers and they uh, and they're stacked up uh, on the counter and it makes it a nice display and it's also easy access and reminds me that I have to use pasta more often. Um, beans and lentils uh, have a tremendously long shelf life and you can keep those in the same kind of containers. Canned goods, don't buy dented cans. You don't know what's inside. It may be no big deal. It may be a very big deal. You want to make sure that if you use nuts and spices, that you use them while, you're, while they are fresh. Um, if you don't use a spice often, and you buy a big thing of it like they have at many in many grocery stores, uh, a Costco-sized container, it's no good to you because unless you use it very, very often because spices um, go bad. They lose their flavor. They lose their uh, aroma. And so it's not, it's not that much of a of a big deal to pay a little bit more and get the smaller container. And speaking of smaller containers that are less expensive, um, Trader Joe's is one of my absolute favorite places to shop. Um, their prices are analogous to the grocery store or less, and their um their quality is, I think, a great deal higher. And they have a marvelous spice section. Um, I uh, 
I buy all of their TJ Spice mixes, and I am able to um, I am able to to zip up recipes that are otherwise um, not really so exotic. Book and then I use them up, and I'm now on my third little bottle of um, their their uh, citrusy garlic. I use that in everything. Um, but I also use a lot of cumin and oregano and thyme. And so those are things that I buy at TJ's on a regular basis. But um, if I, I discovered when I thought I was so smart and I got a bunch of barbecue type um, spice blends in one of the big containers, and um, they, it, they just didn't last. Okay, uh, cereals and grains are cost effective. Next slide. And now we're going to talk about frozen foods. This is, next slide, this is one of my favorite things to talk about, is how to use your freezer to save money. Um, when I was starting out, I, I would look at big pieces of steak or whole chickens or big packages of chicken breasts or thighs. And I would say, I want to spend, you know, less money by buying a whole bunch. But how do I do that? Well, there are cookbooks for one or for two. And um, I consulted them. And the first thing that I realized was... I can buy those packages. I can buy a whole, I think they call it a chub, but it's like 10 pounds of, of ground beef. And I can break that up into hamburger patties. I can use, um, I can have a little bit, put a little bit more in each package and have, have the, um, the amount that I need for a variety of dishes. And so in my freezer, there are many <laughs> um, one pound packages, do it yourself, one pound packages that I have gotten from five or 10 pounds worth of ground beef. Um, you have to label when you put things in the freezer, you have to label them with what they are and when you put them in there because you do get freezer burned sometimes. You do want to use first everything that you bought, uh, bought. You want to use first what you bought first. And so you can sort of organize your freezer by date. I also organize it by um, type of protein. I have a beef section a chicken section, a fish section. And um, that means that I don't have to dig through the whole freezer. And I think that frozen fruits and vegetables are much preferable to the canned versions. They last a tremendously long time. Even freezer burned peas in soup or stew, you can't tell they're freezer burned once they're in there. Um, I think the quality is much better and, um, they're, they're cheap. I don't ever, ever buy things in cans, like fruits and vegetables in, can, in cans. I have seen several recipes lately that call for that. And I thought, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do the frozen kind. Okay, next slide. These are the various dates that you have to um, be able to understand to know um, when something is likely to be good or will be uh, will be uh, bad or or um, not wonderful to eat. Uh, do if you buy a whole bunch of a particular protein, because it's on sale, do go ahead right away and um, uh, divide it all up. Don't think, I'll do that tomorrow. It'll still be good. I threw away 
um, yesterday two huge packages of boneless, skinless chicken breasts and two packages of um, pasta because I I bought them in bulk like I do and then I didn't deal with them. So you don't want things to sit in your fridge waiting for you to portion them for longer than maybe <coughs> 24 hours or so. I was really mad at myself when I had to do that. Okay, slide. And um, this is portioning and storage. Uh, slide, please. I keep, I keep wanting to do this myself. Okay, this is tiny, tiny print, which I'm going to have to uh, lean up to use, but it does give you a lot of information. Um, containers, you want to have good containers, airtight containers for um, whatever you, whatever staples you are setting aside. Make sure that... Um, they are they are uh, not the kind that will um, go bad. Uh, uh, Sheila mentioned that she's having to change her her ways because she discovered uh, that the plastic containers she's been using are not wonderful. Um, glass always works. Um, I, I think it's important that if you are. Um, using flowers and other kinds of, of uh, non-perishable staples that you uh, it, don't just leave them in the bag if you buy a, a pound of flour um, and you don't use flour very often. I don't, but I like to have some on hand. I put it, I either stick it in the freezer or I have a Ziploc bag and I put it in there. And then I put it on the shelf where I store it. Um, okay, I think it's important to. Um, I am. I'm not seeing what I thought was on this slide. Um, I think it's important when you are choosing the kind of container to use that you match the container with what you're going to put in it. And again, if you are putting a container in the freezer rather than just wrapping um, a portion of whatever in plastic wrap and in a Ziploc bag, make sure that you label it. I, I cannot tell you how many times I've taken something out of the freezer and said, what is this? And I have no idea. And if I don't remember what it is, it goes. Next slide, please. Okay, these are several products that I'm not going to talk a lot about um, that will save you money when you are buying groceries. So um, just take a look and, and decide to keep the ones that you think are right for you. Okay, slide, please. And now I have some cookbooks. And these came, uh, the, the descriptions came from Amazon. And here I'm going to turn around because I have some of these cookbooks. Yes, I know you're down there. I also have a demanding cat that has just shown up. Um. I'm going to start out with a cookbook that I forgot to put on here. This is this is easy weeknight cooking, and it's from the New York Times, and it's written by Melissa Clark, who is one of my favorite food columnists from the New York Times. The New York Times has a gigantic website of different kinds of food that you can um, prepare. Uh, recipes, uh, meal planning tips, 
And in order to have access to that and to all of their cooking newsletters, you have to join. But you don't have to join for the whole time. You don't have to subscribe for the whole newspaper. I do because that's my favorite paper. But um, you can subscribe to just the cooking part of it for $6 a month. And I think that it's absolutely worth it. It's a bargain. And now I'm going to show you the latest recipe. And you won't be able to read this, so don't worry about it. The, rec the latest recipe that I used from this, it's called uh, dumpling soup. And you can see there are those little Chinese dumplings in there. This was wonderful. You can also see that I've written in my cookbook. I have I write in all of my cookbooks because I think that that is without a doubt the best way to do it. And this is easy uh, weeknight dinners by Melissa Clark. And then Anita Lowe is a very well-known and very um, experienced and creative uh, professional chef. And Solo is her uh, cooking for one. And not only is it recipes, there are also lots of tips and techniques, some of which we we've already mentioned, so I'm not going to go over them. But this is, without a doubt, an excellent, excellent book for people that are um, cooking just for themselves or for themselves and one other person. And these are some resources I use. I see that I mentioned New York, New York Times here. Um, next slide. And then here are some more resources. Uh, next slide. This is uh, a recipe that I have uh, changed for my own preferences. Next slide. This is the original version. And next slide, it goes on to tell you the story behind the recipe. Next slide. Dean Fearing is, um, used to work at the mansion on Turtle Creek. I ate there once and just loved his tortilla soup. And so uh, this is the original recipe for tortilla soup. Next slide. And this is the instructions. Next slide. And this is what I do. This is my tortilla soup. It's similar, but there are changes. And that's it. Thank you. I hope you'll go back and look at some of the slides that I have uh, that I zipped by so quickly. And um, it's, I hope that you get a lot of good information from it. Thank we you. certainly did. Thank you so much. Okay. Next, we're going to turn to Dr. V, and you have the floor. Thank you, Sheila. And also, thank you, Sue. I was taking some notes on your um, your slides. And then, Joni, I need to look at your adaptive recipes because I'm always looking for, you know, new and creative ways to take a recipe and then adapt it for my own um, tasting and liking. Um, so I'm going to do something a little different. Um, meal prep for you and for your families, your human beings, is very important, as we've heard and seen in all the tips and tricks. So how many of you have furry friends at home? And you can, well, we'll just say virtual hands. I know there's at least one of you, because I know one of you in the audience that does. Uh, and I'm going to speak to meal prep for dogs. Um, and so these are my two little dogs, not really little. On the left is my miniature schnauzer, that's Pino. He is my puppy. He's not a puppy, but he's my five-year-old forever puppy, and he's about 20 pounds. On the right is Gus. He is an American bully. He is about a hundred pounds. And yes, they are best friends. And we um, inherited him when my brother-in-law passed away. So feeding these two monkeys, as I call them, 
they deserve meal prep too, right? They deserve to eat healthy and have a long life like we do. So next slide. So why did I start this? So there's, you know, my love on the right there with me. And all animals, regardless of their type, all animals have one ailment or another, just like humans. You know, things happen and diseases and etc. Well, schnauzers are very poor, uh, prone to pancreatitis, Cushing, diabetes, and skin conditions, and especially pancreatitis. American bullies have a long list of ailments, um, just so many. So, and Gus alone, he has already heart conditions when we got him, or actually when my brother-in-law got him, he had a heart um, conditions. So why not feed them healthy so that they live longer? So giving them a balanced and healthy diet. Uh, if you read on the back of, even for cat food, and I'll talk about cats at the end, but even if you read on the back of your, um, the commercial bags you buy, whether it's at Trader Joe's, at Albertsons, wherever you shop, look at the ingredients. How many of those ingredients do you really know? I will say for a fact that dried Hard commercial food is bad. There's been so many recalls. There's a long list you can look at of recalls. There's those questionable ingredients. If you don't know it, do you want to feed it to your animal? Like, would you eat it? And often there's false marketing. So, and there's even more reasons, but these are three common ones when looking at um, just for um, animals, hard commercial food. I'm only talking about dry hair. So, I wanted, and I started this because I want my animals to live a healthy, long life um, like myself. And actually, everything I prep for them, I can eat and my husband can eat. So next slide. So how I start, and there's lovely Pino again, looking at a squirrel. So the caveat here, this is one example, and it's an example for a miniature schnauzer and then adapted for an American bully. So it may vary based upon the animal um, type, your um, it's not, it's a species, your, your type of animal that you have. So I would just say that because it depends on, you know, their own ailments and their age. There's a lot of factors that go into uh, really what to include in, in the, the meals you create. But I started reading and reading, and um, I love the Schnauzer community. They're so supportive, especially in online um, boards, uh, Facebook groups. The American Bully groups, not so much. They're more about touting those big dogs and for competition, which my dog, even though he is a uh, AKC, uh, all of that, he is not like a bred dog to compete. So I kept doing research and research, and um, I'll, I'll share in the next slide what I found. Um, and I talked to my vet. Now, vets are often hesitant to support meal prep and home cook prep for um, animals because they say they don't get the nutrients that they do need. However, I disagree in everything I've read, and I have resources you'll see at the end. Um, I found this lovely group and it's such a wonderful community. Everyone is so supportive. People ask questions. There's tons of resources. So this is where I started. And it wasn't where I started. I just found it on Facebook. So it's Home Cooking for Schnauzers. You see there's over 12,000 people in there. There are so many resources. If you can click one more time, Sheila. Um, Connie Pavey, I have to give credit to her. I don't know her, but Connie's the admin for the site, and there are a ton of resources that are updated. They're updated regularly, especially the home cooking basics. And it gives such a wealth of data about how to just get started when you're considering prep. And a lot of this applies to any dog. So everything from thinking about um, how much to feed, cooking, supplements, all of that. But again, you have to research what's for your, your type of dog. Okay, next slide. So I talked to the vet and I didn't get much support. So that's when I did all my research and reading and everything. And I decided, okay, well, I'm going to do this. Um, my husband kind of got jealous. He's like, why are you investing so much time for the dog meal prep? But what about us? So I actually do it for us too, but not in as, as uh, diligent as I probably should. So I figured we could eat this too, but I really want to, be for my dogs who do have some ailments, if it will help and improve. And that's where tracking is important. 
But scheduling time, I know Sheila, all of us actually think you've talked about time because I buy, I shop at Aldi, even though I have to fight the parking lot, Costco, fight the parking lot. But um, I buy all of my ingredients primarily from Aldi and Costco. And I do all of my prep on the weekend for the full week. And I use on the right here, this is just an example. Um, this was carrots, kind of carrots, cucumber, apple, and um, lean ground turkey. And I use the snapware. I get it. You can, I can get it on Amazon or wherever, but it's BPA free and all that. And so, and then I put it in the freezer and I label it with a date. And I'll talk about the portioning in a minute. But the cost is about the same. I've been tracking costs. And actually, I think it's a little cheaper. And it really depends on what you include there's so many ingredients you can include and it saves money fewer vet visits healthier next slide so the long there's so many i don't even have time to go into the long list but there are some things you cannot it's probably better to look at the list of what not to feed pets versus the long list of what you can feed them um but protein I have been doing the lean ground turkey and then also the chicken, but you can do so many things uh, for dogs, everything from lean ground beef. Oh, I also, the Alaskan wild caught salmon, I buy at Costco and um, that I do give them. Though my one dog doesn't really like fish, so it's kind of being sneaky and convincing them. Um, rabbit, bison, I mean, even eggs. Like there's so many things. Um, one thing I will say, caveat, um, no grains. Um, a lot of foods have grains in them, like the commercial products, but grains are often hard on the um, digestive tract of a dog. And they also uh, metabolize um, into um, like the animal flesh and into fat. So being careful with the grains and that includes your starches. So um, they can also lead to joint problems and inflammation and other things. So you can do your research, but fruits are great. A wide variety. I have started putting blueberries and my dogs love blueberries. Um, veggies of all sorts. And this uh, this photo, I use carrots and green beans. Um, and then you can use herbs. Again, you know, depends on what your dog uh, type is. Um, supplements, two non-negotiables, which I highly recommend, are the omega-3 and the calcium. Now, if you're going to give them the salmon, you might not put in the omega-3 at that time. Um, I put turmeric, but there's a whole list of others. And as needed, there might be other supplements they need. Cooking. You can cook various ways. Um, I mentioned about the vet, why they might disapprove. Just making sure it's balanced. So trying to vary. If I did the same recipe every week for the rest of their life, it's not a balanced diet. So I need to ensure that I have a balance between the protein, the veggies, the fruits, the herbs, and those supplements. And we already talked about labeling and freezing. Next slide. Um, this is just, I want to uh, put this out there about how much to feed. There's actually a formula and you can apply this to any dog because it does depend on their weight. So what their weight is and an easy example I'll give you. And this is thanks to Connie. This is another, this is from Connie, but here's another example. If your dog, so it's your dog's weight in pounds times the percentage. So you can use a digital cooking scale to measure your food. I have not done that yet. I need to really do that to make sure I am being accurate. But most dogs need be, need between 2 to 4%. But it could be higher if your dog has a higher um, metabolism. So tracking your weight, and I'm not doing this. I need to do this. Tracking the weight of your dog as you adjust your food um, amounts is really important. And so the example, if the ideal weight of your dog is 10 pounds, that's the ideal weight. You would take 10 times 4%, so it's 0.4. And then you take 0.4 times 16, that gives you 6.4. Two meals at 3.2 ounces each, or one meal at 6.4 ounces. It's an easy calculation, you just gotta practice it. But it's really based on the ideal weight of what you want your dog or where your dog should be. Um, and then, when you start this, mix it with their current food to transition because you don't want them to get sick or if um, you do a drastic change, they might not like it, number one, but if you do a drastic change, it could impact their um, digestive uh, system. Next slide. So other suggestions. I mentioned this, recording weight and tracking. I need to do this. It's very simple. We have tons of tools, right? I'm sure there's even an app that would help me here. Um, and I've already noticed from Gus, my big dog, my 100-pound boy, he's already lost weight. 
And I know this as a fact because we take him for walks, both of them every day. And his um, harness is already looser. So he has lost weight. And you can see it actually on his skin. His is more visible. Pino, it's hard to tell. Um, also checking their stools. I think this is important for animals because depending on what you're giving them, they might be smaller, harder, I mean, softer, harder, you know, just tracking all of that. And there's a ton of resources I gave you here if you're on Facebook. Um, there's a couple of really great books. And there's mm -hmm. a website, Dogs Naturally. Now, my next step, I have two kitty cats. They're on the left, Leo and Petite. So I want to learn how to do this for my kitty cats once I get the dog process down. That's it. Thank you. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Now we're going to open up the floor to all of our community here to let us know what your thoughts are, what your suggestions are. Let's see, our Q&A should be open. Um, if anyone has any questions for either of our three panelists or suggestions, suggestions of food um, content creators, etc. Okay, we have one question that came in. For panelists and attendees who have been meal prepping for a while, when you repeat the same foods for consecutive days, any mental motivation tips for spicing things up? My roommates and I sometimes find it challenging to have or sustain an appetite due to work-life stress. Wonderful. Um, I will say that for lunches, what I would do is um, three of the same meal and then two of a different meal so that you can alternate it through the week. Um, do any of our other panelists have any other suggestions? I generally try and um, make only, uh, when I'm making a large pot or, or a, a mass of food, I generally try and uh, have only two or three meals that are just the same. If you get more than that, you do get tired of eating it. Um, and I'll, I will eat leftovers twice and then I'm done. So what I generally do is uh, leave some, leave a couple of meals of a, of a big stew or a big pot of something in the refrigerator. And then I break the rest of it down into portions. Um, Ziploc bags are wonderful and put them in the freezer. Uh, and by the way, if you're if you make soup, which I do, and my soup is always I have a pot this big. Um, uh, when I freeze it, I try and lay it down flat in the Ziploc bag so that I have I have a flat surface and then I can stack them like uh, books. Or if I stack them going up, then um, they're easier to stack. And uh, by the time that I am ready to eat the whatever it is again, um, it, it tastes just as good. Sometimes I adjust seasoning or something like that. Great I was going to say that I, I um, so, use yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I saw what your comment was. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that, that I will change the side dishes. Or that's when I go on to allrecipes.com and put in what my leftovers are, and it will give me something new. And you can do it. Somebody else said they use chat GPT. You know, that that is a, a also a, something we can use. Great. And Dr. V says, same for animals. I vary. We and my husband and I can eat what they eat. I vary every other week with different proteins, veggies, and fruits. As you saw, I think recipes and communities also give you ideas on how to spice up mentally. All right. Other questions, comments? Jennifer? 
just looking back over our chat. We have about five more minutes if other participants want to suggest um, recipe sites or home economics ideas that you have for the group. We've learned so much today. Well, I'll just say one more thing, and it's not that I'm getting paid by Aldi, but there was a big article <laughs> in the paper yesterday saying that Aldi has um, all the ingredients for a Thanksgiving dinner from turkey, stuffing, yams, um, cranberries, green beans, um, pumpkin pie. You can buy all those things at Aldi for 10 people for $47, which brings it down to $4.70 a person. And so the article was written just saying that, you know, shopping around, you can really get deals, not just at Aldi, but at lots of these different stores. You just have to pay attention. That's right. Yes, I don't think we have Aldi's in Northern California. I'm not sure that we do. Um, we have Grocery Outlet, which I do love myself. We don't have all these. I've searched and searched. You'll just have to move, Joni. Oh, oh, I don't here. know. I'm, I might even think about that. But I live really close to a very good Trader Joe's. And uh, so I'm, I'm loath to leave that. Well, that's fine. Uh, we've got some really good participants here. You must have some ideas of what works for you um, or things that any of us said today that have changed your mind about something. Can I add one thing? Um, and this came from, I don't know if Laura is still here. Laura, I'm not to put you on the spot. Um, Laura is my research assistant. Uh, and Laura recommended, if you have animals, there is a supplement that um, she gives her dog, it's called The Daily. It's from nativepet.com and it's an all-in-one supplement. So I think too, looking at supplement, not just creating the meals and the, you know, proteins, veggies, fruits, whatever, whether it's for humans or animals, but what supplements are you ensuring that we and then your animals are getting those supplements that we all need? So just want to throw that out there and highlight what Laura had shared with me. I will say, Michelle, um, I used to do um, home cooking for the dogs, but then it, it just got to be too much for me. But we've got a dog with a sensitive stomach and some other issues. So I have found um, limited ingredient pet foods really have cut down on his allergies. And same thing, you look for the sales. So we buy the high-end stuff, but you can get a two-for-one um, or you buy X number of cans and you, you get so many free. So you can um, do it both ways. I think your way would be um, probably the best because it's not pre prepackaged, but there still are other ways to do it economically. All right, checking to see if we have any more comments come through. I hope that this was a helpful session for our school community today. I want to say thank you so much to all three of our guest panelists for sharing your insights. We've all been students before. We know the drill, but it's great to have this conversation and bring some ideas to the forefront. Um, thank you to Dr. Bodar, Dr. Allman, and Dr. Viagran for sharing some of your day with us. This uh, episode will be part of our Advising and Outreach playlist on YouTube, so you can check it out there and catch some of the websites that were suggested in the presentation. Thanks a lot. Any final thoughts from our panelists? Um, just be vigilant and um, have fun with cooking. I agree. Having fun is the most important thing. And it's a journey. It's, it's, a, it's just a journey. It's practicing and you, you know, adapt as you go. So it's a journey. And thank don't you all for developing for so offering cool. this. <laughs> One at a time. Go ahead, Dr. Sue. I just wanted to say thank you for organizing this. My pleasure. Joni? And don't forget to write in your cookbooks. When you make a recipe, if you don't do it 
precisely as the cookbook said, make notes. It's a good thing. Um, That's right. cookbooks are supposed to be tattered and worn and stained. It's, it's the way that they get. Wonderful. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. Take care. Stay safe out there. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.